Kia ora koutou and welcome tonight to Christchurch Conversations. Uh, ko Jessica Halliday tōku ingoa, ko aho te kai whakahaere o te pūtahi, Christchurch Centre for Architecture and City Making. It's a, a pleasure and a privilege for me um, and the rest of the small Te Putahi team to work with Regenerate Christchurch on this Christchurch Conversation series, Bold Thinking for the Red Zone. This is a forum for invited and local thought leaders and the public to discuss the future of the Otakaro Avon River Corridor. The Red Zone comprises over 600 hectares of land connecting the city and the sea. And this provides us with this rare opportunity to create a future for this area that positively benefits all of Christchurch and New Zealand, perhaps both human and non-human species. There have already been a huge amount of exciting ideas put forward by individuals, interest groups and community groups. And I'd like to acknowledge the significant amount of work that has gone into these proposals. Regenerate Christchurch is using this conversation to spark further public discussion and debate about the future of this area, to stimulate new ideas and to refine existing ones. Through the Christchurch Conversations program, independent speakers are sharing their thoughts frankly, and some of their ideas are bold and challenging, and that's with the purpose of stimulating debate and discussion. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Christina Hill, who is Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture, Environmental Planning and Urban Design at the University of California, Berkeley. Associate Professor Hill studies urban ecology and hydrology in relationship to physical design and social justice issues. Her primary area of work is in adapting urban districts and shore zones to the new challenges associated with climate change. Christina holds both a PhD and a Master's of Landscape Architecture from Harvard University, with a Bachelor of Science in Geology from Tufts University. Christina first became known internationally as a scholar of ecological design, as a faculty member at MIT, where she worked to identify changes to urban water infrastructure that could better support regional biodiversity. Professor Hill lectures internationally on urban design and ecology. Her book, Ecology and Design, Frameworks for Learning, was published by Island Press in 2002. And her current book project, which I now understand may feature Christchurch, proposes ways of adapting urban waterfronts to climate change while incorporating productive ecosystems. So this current area of research for Christina encompasses urban resilience in the changing global environment. Christina focuses particularly on climate change, sea level rise, and the sort of development that can enhance a city's ability to recover from disaster events. Tonight, she'll discuss her recent work in, San, in the San Francisco Bay Area, a region that, like Christchurch, is challenged by a rising water table in a seismic zone. She'll share strategies for addressing these issues and describe recent engineering proposals that tie together seismic benefits and sea level rise adaptation. Now, some of the ideas may offer opportunities for how Christchurch could adapt to the challenges and opportunities presented by climate change and what new designs and responses might work for the red zone. Flooding and sea level rise are topics that affect many Christchurch residents. And we acknowledge that there may be a number of you here tonight in the audience or watching online who are already experiencing uncertainty and distress about what these changes might mean for your homes and your communities in the future. We want to ensure that you have access to support if needed. So tonight, Dot Mitchell is here from Presbyterian Support and you can talk to her if you so desire after the event. So just come down to the front and I'll be really happy to introduce you to Dot. At the end of Christina's presentation, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions about the topics and examples that Christina raises. 
This also applies to our online audiences tonight as well, so you can ask a question um, as we're live streaming on Regenerate Christchurch's Facebook page. <coughs> It's important to note that Christina isn't here to tell us what to do in Christchurch. She's here to share design ideas and thinking that is emerging and in use around the world. Across the Christchurch Conversation series, not all concepts raised by speakers will apply to the red zone, and it's important to recognise that no final decisions have yet been made about any of the ideas being discussed. The intent of the series is to engage you, and hopefully a wider public, including those who have not already been involved in the conversation so far, or those who think decisions have already been made. Regenerate Christchurch has a goal of ensuring that all potential users, uses are considered to achieve the best possible outcome for Christchurch and New Zealand. I'm a historian, an architectural historian, and I think it's important to acknowledge that while the conversation tonight is focused on the future use of this land, we're mindful that for many past and present residents and surrounding communities of the red zone, that the experiences of loss and upheaval are still being felt today, and that any new ideas can be difficult to process from that position of loss and, up and upheaval. It's important to keep the past in mind as we also plan for the future. If tonight's discussions raise further issues or questions for you that aren't appropriate to address to, with Christina, there are Regenerate Christchurch staff here tonight um, who are happy to talk to you after her presentation. Tonight's event is one of a range of opportunities for you to get involved in this topic, important topic and area and discussion. So thank you for coming along tonight to be involved in the discussion about what might happen in the red zone. Just a little housekeeping. Um, you're very welcome to take pictures during this event and to upload them to social media. Um, our hashtag, if you want to use it, is Christchurch Conversations, ch, -ch Conversations, one word. Um, but if you do take photos, please be aware that there are others around you and that photos can be distracting for your neighbours and those behind you. It's also a good time to remind you to put your phone on silent if you haven't already. Do be aware that media are present tonight and that this event is being live streamed on Regenerate Christchurch's Facebook page. Um, and the video of tonight's event will be uploaded onto Regenerate Christchurch's website next week and the Teipatahi website. Of course, in the event of an emergency, the exits are to either side and at the back. We're on Air New Zealand. No, we're not. Um, in the event, uh, so that's where you go in emergency, and the ushers will take care of you, um, and our meeting point is the piazza to the west of the building. So I really hope that you enjoy and benefit from this evening. I hope Christina gets you thinking um, and prepare those questions as we go along. Christina's going to talk for about 45 minutes and then I'll come back up on stage and together hopefully we'll have a really rich discussion and Q&A session for around about 30 minutes and we are going to finish by 7.30. So this series is brought to you by Regenerate Christchurch and in the Christchurch conversation, that whole series is actually part of a program that Te Putahi has been running with uh, Christchurch City Council for the last few years, but Regenerate Christchurch decided to adopt it and to enlarge it and enrich it with this Red Zone conversation. There are further events, three more events in the series, so you should keep an eye on the Regenerate Christchurch website for details and dates, and you can sign up to receive their newsletter on their website, and there's also an option to sign up to Te Putahi's newsletter in the foyer. Now, I have spoken enough already, so please join me in welcoming Christina Hill tonight. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I haven't had a previous opportunity to spend time like this in New Zealand. Uh, I think of New Zealand as a place where there's a real independent spirit, some creativity that's missing in a lot of other communities sometimes, and a real base in uh, community thinking uh, and kind of decency. So thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and not in the United States right now. Um, 
I wanted to uh, share some ideas with you that are um, being developed by me and by others uh, for the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'll be taking you to look at some examples in the UK, in uh, Germany. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about San Francisco, and then I want to show an example from the Netherlands, and then come back to San Francisco. So we're doing a lot of traveling. I hope everyone's ready for that. Uh, we in the San Francisco area are already experiencing um, flooding periodically, and this uh, photograph shows the Embarcadero in downtown San Francisco, where king tides, the astronomical high tides in the year, already flood the sidewalk. Um, the seawall is going to be replaced at some point, but uh, we know that this is all really happening to us, so we're trying to take a positive, proactive approach to it. My first degree is in geology, as Jessica mentioned, and um, I like to look at the long past to get a sense of really where we are. Um, so I looked at data like this to try to understand um, what the past has been like. And obviously, this is, these are, uh, as this is a trend in sea level rise. So you can see there have been periods of really rapid sea level rise. And then somewhere around 10,000 years ago to 8,000 years ago, it slowed down. And in the last 8,000 years, that's when the great deltas of the world formed, because sea level, the shoreline position was fairly stable. And cities really were only invented in the last 5,000 years or so. So we've never actually had to manage cities during an era of rapid sea level rise. But we're clearly headed back to the roller coaster on this one. We don't know, obviously, how fast or how much sea level is going to rise. This is from a paper by uh, James Hansen and his colleagues showing that there has already been um, a change. There was a change in the slope, the rate of sea level rise somewhere back in the 30s, according to these data, and somewhere in around 1990. So we're seeing something that's not a steady slope. It's something that clearly is changing in rate. Uh, and that's just empirical data. That's not a projection or a model. That's what we've observed in the world. Hansen has also provided us with some very scary modeling to help us see the range of possible futures that we could be at a meter of sea level rise by as soon as 2050 or as late as 2110. This is what's possible. And unfortunately, we won't know which train we're on until somewhere around 2030. Uh, so that's the situation we're in. We have a wide range of possibilities of how high the sea level may get and how quickly. And coping with that uncertainty is just flat out hard. Uh, it's difficult to decide from a kind of moral perspective how much work our generation should do to help future generations. And it's difficult to decide how much we should do uh, today for something that may not happen for 50 years. In California, we've just revisited our uh, planning guidance and the science about how things are changing. And uh, we're looking at new numbers that have just come out from our um, kind of expert science panel that the governor convened. And they are talking about the possibility, um, the likelihood of sea level rising by 2100, somewhere uh, a little greater than a meter to about a half a meter. Or, or actually less, and then uh, the possibility of a scenario that's extreme, which are this green column is our national government's estimates before the change in administration. <laughs> this was the last uh, report that the scientists managed to get out before they had to leave the offices. Um, and uh, we're talking about a possible scenario of three meters. So it's an uh, extreme scenario, but it's possible, and now our elected officials are having to decide what guidance to give uh, communities in the state about what number they should accept as a planning target. And the sense that we have right now is the more expensive the infrastructure or project is, the more it's going to be required to consider the extreme scenario and try to be ready for that. My question is always, Okay, we know that we're ending this long, stable period. What should we do in the last stable decades of an 8,000-year stable period? Probably not sit around and wait. Here we are, we know what's happening. Future generations are gonna ask us why we knew it was happening, what did we do? So I'm arguing more for us to be uh, more prepared because of the 
incredibly important transition that we're going through. And the question I don't think is how to survive, but really how to thrive. How to adapt in a way that's beneficial for us and for other species. And it may not be the same species 100 years from now, but there'll be a mix of species that make use of the diverse landscapes that we create. So the question is, uh, how do we and other species thrive? The Dutch in Rotterdam are already, I've worked uh, closely with the Dutch for almost, well, 12 years now, since uh, right after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Um, they are on Water Plan 2.0, uh, possibly 3.0 by now. And what they like to uh, remind everyone is that not only is there more extreme precipitation expected, both locally and in your watershed, possibly far away, but the rising sea level will also drive a rising groundwater table. And that's because the seawater is denser and the fresh water is lighter and it sits on top of the sea level. So as it rises, we expect to see um, a higher and more extensive areas of high water tables. So that's an important point. We've learned about that in the US through recent work in Hawaii. We weren't expecting it. I don't know why, it's kind of an obvious thing from a geological perspective, but um, it took studies like this, whoops, I'm sorry, that show uh, where Honolulu would flood based just on saltwater sea level rise of a meter compared to where Honolulu would flood based on that saltwater sea level rise of a meter plus flooding driven by freshwater groundwater. So this is saltwater plus freshwater. That's terrifying for the city of Honolulu um, and something we've all had to try to replicate in thinking about other cities. This is a new map of groundwater depth in the Bay Area that my team has just made. We just finished it two weeks ago and we're just beginning to incorporate it into planning. Uh, this is based on well data around the Bay Area, and everything that's red shows an area that's within about a meter of the surface. So as sea level rises a meter, all those red areas will actually have emergent groundwater, which is ponding on the surface. So we have a lot of work to do. Those are very urban areas. Um, along this edge that show in red on this map. So that's going to be a challenge. That's how we're reframing adaptation. It's not just keeping the waves out, not just keeping the ocean out. It's dealing with this very high freshwater groundwater that's coming up around us. So I wanted to share with you um, some work that's been done in uh, the UK and in the Netherlands and in Germany, uh, but first present it in a kind of typology. Most people will give you a sense of what adaptation strategies there are using lists or presenting their favorite idea. And my colleagues from the Netherlands in the big engineering firms have a tendency to come out and propose uh, expensive, movable, mechanical structures. Um, I would put those into the class of dynamic walls, big storm surge barriers and tide gates. There's a lot of money in that, obviously, so private firms are going to be interested in doing those for us. This structure is just a concrete panel wall with rebar, steel rebar, mounted on a, a, an earthen berm. And that's the kind of very brittle strategy that's been used in New Orleans for a long time. And we're starting to see it used in the Bay Area. So the work that I'm doing is in part to counter the use of these brittle concrete and steel structures or very expensive mechanical structures that um, we may invest in in our generation and then future generations, if they have extreme sea level, will have to pull big pieces out and replace them with larger pieces because the foundations of those structures are sized to the height. And if we get the height wrong, we have to take out the whole thing and we've created essentially a liability for future generations instead of a benefit. These landform strategies, the old ones, the classics, are um, dikes and canals, very efficient. You just take material out and you pile it up right next to the hole, um, and you can control a lot of groundwater movement just using dikes and canals. And the second one there is the sand engine. I'll show you some photos of that. Um, it is a big sand spit, 22 some odd million cubic meters of sand that the Dutch have placed on their coast to try to nourish the coast, that sand being moved then by wind and waves instead of by bulldozers. So that's the new Dutch vision. Uh, they'll sell you either one. So 
You have to be a good client to know what you're getting, what you want. So we have a wall. Uh, this old 19th century wall has, um, it's not really a, a wall we would design today. It's really a pile of rocks that has footings in it um, and uh, concrete facing material. And it holds in the fill as much as it holds out the waves. And it needs to be replaced because in our seismically active region, it's cracked and we need it to be higher. It, we estimate the cost of replacing the San Francisco seawall between four and five billion dollars. It's not a small project. So getting the height of it right is really critical. That's one of the problems of walls. This is a wall in New Orleans, a uh, hurricane in 2006, and it's just a concrete wall reinforced with rebar. These are journalists looking for a good photo. There's no way I would ever walk along that wall. It's like a, you know, a, a building uh, wall holding back the ocean. This is not a good idea. Debris bounces up against it, and that's what, of course, caused the failure of some of these walls in New Orleans uh, in Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And people in New Orleans live behind these walls below sea level and cannot actually see the dynamic environment in which they live and which puts them at risk. They don't see the changing water levels. They don't see the tides coming in and out. This, to me, is the dumbing down of human capacity to be resourceful and to adapt, to live behind walls like this. So I'm anti-wall. <laughs> there are a lot of other reasons to be uh, anti-wall. For example, putting in seawalls reflects wave energy and erodes beaches. We've seen that all around the world. Uh, and eventually undermines the foundations of the walls themselves. But I use this um, four-quadrant diagram with communities because what people often come to the table wanting is some kind of fixed wall or dynamic wall they've seen pictures of in the New York Times. Uh, I was on a call-in radio show, and for an hour, every single person who called in said, why can't we build a storm surge barrier in the Golden Gate? Well, it would be illegal. It would turn the entire bay into a freshwater water body eventually when it had to be closed. And it would be a brittle uh, wall that could fail catastrophically and would be extremely expensive um, for, for us and for future generations. So instead, I try to get everybody to look at this quadrant here and expand the conversation because not only do these dynamic landforms do very muscular work, what the Dutch called a, call a safety backbone, uh, function, but they also provide multiple benefits. They provide habitat, recreation, uh, increased land value, quality of life. This is getting to the thrive part of adaptation, not just the survive. And they're transformable over time. If our generation lays down three uh, or a meter of material to make a marsh and raise our edge to protect it, the next generation can just add more material. And if we put it in the wrong place, they can bulldoze it someplace else. And it's local material. You're not competing on the open market for Chinese steel to put inside of, of concrete walls. You're using your local material to be able to make adaptation uh, strategies happen. So I keep pushing people to that direction, at least to consider it. And the trick then, once we're talking about some of these strategies down here, is to pair them with the right kind of urban district. If we think our urban districts can persist while they're vulnerable to all kinds of flooding, this is the old New Orleans condition, uh, the buildings were at grade, and when a flood happened, things were damaged in expensive ways, and no one could get to their stuff. They had to leave. You've seen these photographs, I'm sure, of people um, evacuating in waist-high water while people in boats try to help them get their stuff out, some of it. Uh, this is the new condition in New Orleans where the streets flood, but the buildings have been raised in many neighborhoods. Your stuff is dry, but you still can't drive. And it's great for temporary, but it's not great for permanent, because unless you plan to use a boat every day, a permanent new high water level that floods the street is obviously a problem. Um, and then the question of how to be truly adaptive, if we use these landform strategies, we probably need to have an urban system that actually is ready for some flooding. That would allow us to spend less money on the edge, not have it be so high, and have some of that water occasionally overtop and come over into urban areas. 
Um, and in addition, we have to be ready for the water table to change, which in my region and in yours is a big factor in uh, earthquake risk. That's how one of the main criteria for defining a liquefaction zone. So uh, in New Orleans, they don't have earthquakes. They do need to move to raising structures. Um, that's kind of the Rotterdam condition today. This is the Hafen city in Hamburg. I'm going to show you some pictures of in just a minute. And then um, I wanted to uh, share with you three ideas that I think design could push to accomplish, design and public policy together. Um, not just the way things work, but the ideas associated with these designs. They are um, encouraging people to be brave, pull their money together, and invest in something together. And that's hard in the United States. I don't know if that it's so hard here, but it's really hard in the United States because our story is the story the media tell over and over again in the United States and that elected officials tell is that government is not competent. Government needs to be smaller, the budgets need to be smaller, and the private sector needs to do the real work. And that really ties our hands in a lot of ways. So the courage to invest together to make public works is really critical. Uh, feeling resourceful is also critical. If we feel, you know, in a doom and gloom story, like we can't handle it, this is too scary, it's too much, uh, then we don't take action and we don't watch the world as it's changing and learn to live with its changes and make rational choices over time. So feeling resourceful, I think design, I'll show you some examples of how I think design can help us feel more resourceful together. Uh, and then expanded compassion. I think that's critical both in terms of relating to other species and in terms of working with multiple publics, understanding the needs of people unlike ourselves and really being able to reach across to other communities. Um, people with physical disabilities who have a harder time evacuating or uh, managing a different environment. So thinking about how we can expand compassion as we adapt. Um, and in many ways that may be one of the most important uh, things that design can convey. So I wanna show you first uh, something that I think of as an example of promoting the courage to invest which is the Thames Barrier Project from way back in the Thatcher years in the UK. Uh, it opened in between 84 and 86 in response to flooding that happened in 1953. So it took a long time to get this together. It's a beautiful design. The steel on the outside of these tower structures is just doing the job of uh, preventing corrosion in the mechanical parts. But, and of course, it, it won an award from the steel industry. You use a lot of stainless steel, you win an award from the steel industry. Um, but what's interesting is what you see when you look up close at these structures. And when I went and took my own photographs, I realized that there were bilateral symmetries in the structure that aren't necessary for functional reasons. And it occurred to me that maybe some of the inspiration for the architects who did it was to think about a historic structure that was really important to the Anglo-Saxon warrior. This comes from about 700 AD. It was found in the Sutton Hoo archeological dig, which many people in the UK are familiar with and have seen. Um, and what I saw then was that the series of these towers is in a sense a reference to a series of Anglo-Saxon warriors protecting the city of London from danger, and that's beautiful. It's a reference to something that's kind of a, a martial language, a you know, warrior kind of culture, but at the same time, they use this lighting on the barrier structure to make people feel, people feel like they're returning to the hearth when they come back up the river uh, on their boats. And you'll see a lot of uh, videos people have put online of traveling through the Thames barrier. It's a really, really well-loved piece of infrastructure, and in that sense, to me, it's very successful. If we love our infrastructure, we invest in it, and we understand its value. So I think that was a great example of design promoting uh, courage to invest. Now I wanna show you an example from Hamburg that I think is a great example of promoting shared resourcefulness. This is a warehouse district of Hamburg. Most of the old city is above the levee, but this warehouse district, it's no longer needed because of containerization of uh, shipping goods, and it was slated to become a mixed-use district, a lot of housing, but it floods. Once or twice a year, they get a pretty serious flood. 
So they had to decide how to uh, design it. And what they chose was a Dutch idea, a Dutch urban designer named Kees uh, Christiansen, said, why don't we take these finger wharves and uh, build them up with earth so that they're, that they're terraced from the outer edge to the higher inner spine, make some public spaces that float and some public spaces that are robust for waves and debris that come with the flooding, and encourage ourselves to live in this environment on a series of terrace levels. And I'll show you an example of that. So here's a first floor that's um, closed visually because it's either earth behind that batter wall, that protective wall, or it's a waterproof parking garage. And uh, that's what they do in the first story. The first level is a pedestrian promenade, and then there's this waterproof first story, and then the second level up here, accessible from, I'm pointing to the wall, but you know what I mean, uh, accessible from raised terrace walkways is cafes and retail and so on. But let me show you what happens in this interesting first terrace. This is the uh, low tide level. It's on the conventional seawall. This is that waterproof first story. In a flood, well, in a high tide, the water is still on the seawall face, and in a flood, it comes right up to that first story. So you see the value of a waterproof parking garage. People don't evacuate. They stay and they watch the flooding happen with their kids. This is kind of unthinkable in an American context. We get the word that we have to evacuate. It's legally required that we re evacuate. You can be uh, put in jail for staying and not evacuating. So the idea that people stay, teach their children what's going on with this flooding, put their cars into waterproof parking garages, except this person who must be on vacation in Malaga. <laughs> they literally get an email that says, put your car in the parking garage. Um, and being able to adapt that way is like the opposite of what we've done in New Orleans. Seeing what's changing in the environment, I think, is the key to helping people become more resourceful, to be better at making choices about what to do with their private property, how to participate in the larger society, and how to adapt over time. This is the future plan for the Hoffman City District, which is to put mid-rise buildings with waterproof first stories and deep friction pile foundations into the water itself of the canals. And it's an exciting idea for us in urban design because everyone who lives near a lot of water um, would like to think that there are places where we could actually live right on the water. And that's what the uh, Germans plan to do in their next phase. So this example of having uh, different terraces and foundations, pile foundations, is really from the Hoffman City, but it's something that we may be able to do in San Francisco Bay, combined with dynamic landforms and the use of other uh, canal and pond type strategies. So I want to show you a little bit about San Francisco Bay. I know a lot of you uh, probably have been there, but um, it's a large area. All that gray is urban, so it's very urbanized. Uh, we have complex food webs. We care passionately about the environment and biodiversity, both because the law requires us to and because it's the culture of the place. And I think we have that in common, um, where we don't share those values necessarily with the Dutch, um, who don't have the same biodiversity potential or existing uh, species that we do. So we try to understand how the changes that are occurring um, are going to affect this incredibly complex web of species. And we try to expand compassion to non-human species as well, as well as to differences within the human community. Uh, an author I like in particular, California academic Donna Haraway, has written a book called Staying with the Trouble. And I think that's a great phrase for thinking about what it is that our challenge is over the next uh, foreseeable future is to not deny what's happening, not avoid the complexity of it, not necessarily have a silver bullet solution, but keep looking at it, stay with it, try to understand what's happening in a way, you know, in our, as full people and as diverse communities. So I, want, I put this slide in to be able to show you um, what the scale of the bay is that I work on compared to the estuary here. Uh, because it's a big area, it's a thousand kilometers, between a thousand kilometers in length and two thousand kilometers in length, depending on how you measure it. 
So it's a big shoreline, and it's going to be expensive to do things with. Uh, we have a lot of earthquake faults that we know about. This is the active one, and we're waiting for an 8.0. Um, we have high odds of it happening very soon, and there are a lot of uh, faults that go this way, or fields of faults down here towards the bay as well. So, like you, we're a very active zone. Um, we've had a shoreline, it's a little faded, but you can see different lines here that describe shapes of the bay. Um, this one represents 15,000 years ago. Uh, this one out here represents uh, 10,000 years ago. I'm sorry, this is 5,000 years ago. Here's 15,000 years ago. So the bay is really a recent geographical phenomenon from a geological point of view. And there's no reason to get all hung up about exactly the position of the shoreline. It's varied. It's been farther out. It's been farther in. Our law right now requires us to recognize the current shoreline, but um, it's going to change again. It's been dynamic. It's going to be dynamic. And the question is, how do we optimize what's land and what's water as these changes occur? These are all uh, shown in light blue, the areas that will flood with, uh, oh, I'm going to do my conversion, sorry, this one's still in inches, uh, less than a third of a meter, or about a third of a meter um, is light blue, flooded with light blue, and then the dark blue comes as we get to um, more like a meter and a half. So there's a lot of land that, could, that will flood if we don't act. We have different wave energy environments in the Bay Edge, from high wave energy environments on the ocean coast and at the um, Golden Gate, to places that have very low wave energy. And we have to match the adaptation strategy to the, the energy regime of that section of shoreline. If you've got a lot of waves, that's not a good place to put a wetland. You have to size the material to the conditions. We also have to think about shallowness um, these light blue areas are very shallow, and these are the areas where we plan to do wetlands as part of our adaptation strategy, because it's only uh, a meter to three meters deep, and that's a very reasonable place to add material. Um, these wetlands that we have, we, we lost about 95% of the wetlands around the bay between 1848, the gold rush, and uh, 1958. And then they passed a law saying you can't take away any more wetlands, and we began restoring. So up by about 1999, people had restored um, about uh, 12,000 hectares of land and of wetlands, I'm sorry, 19,000 hectares. And they wanted to develop this ambitious goal, they developed an ambitious goal of restoring 42,000 hectares of wetland. And they think the cost of that, they thought the cost of that in 1999 would be about 1.4 billion. Uh, they created a new government agency to be in charge of that because it's you know, basically not trusting any of the existing government agencies to do a good job of it. The San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, they got that through the state legislature. It had no budget. It's easy to create a government that has no budget. It's harder to actually give it a budget. But you can see here all the places in, in uh, this terracotta color where it's potential wetland that they'd like to restore. And that's where they would get to 42,000 hectares. The reason that they want to do it originally was mostly biodiversity and recreation and uh, the quality of life that people associate with having a beautiful natural environment uh, around the Bay Edge. But the other reason that we're pursuing now is really um, the effect of wetlands of a fringing marsh on wave height. And what we're learning is that only, uh, this is in feet, but about 60 meters of wetland can reduce the wave height by more than 70%. And that's very important, because the wave energy is going to do a lot of the erosion associated with sea level rise. So if we can bring down the wave height, trip them, and have that water come in in a smoother way, we'll be able to buy time, uh, prevent erosion, and be able to live on the coast for longer, while we also add environmental value. So that's why we're so excited about it now and how we um, basically passed a new bill that uh, charges everyone $12 a parcel to build wetlands on the edge of the bay. And that's, I think, one of the first measures passed in America where people have voted to tax themselves to adapt to sea level rise. 
This is a diagram that kind of shows uh, a little bit of the problem and how we're thinking about it. Um, we need some kind of levee, some kind of dike structure. We need something that manages excess stormwater because once you build a dike, the water doesn't flow out by gravity. So you'll have, we'll have to store it and then find some way for it to flow through the levee or over the levee. And then here I'm trying to show uh, you need different materials for different wave energy environments. Sand is great for a kind of moderate wave energy environment. Uh, shingle or rock um, breakwaters will be needed for higher wave energy environments. And silt for wetlands really works the best in low to moderate environments. So it's a matching, a pairing process like wine and cheese. How do we get uh, the right structure, the right size material, and the right kind of urban district? This is one of the ideas that's going forward very rapidly now. Um, this is a, a wetland wedge that sits in front of a levee. It's a proposal. Uh, the idea is to have about uh, up to 300 meters, but as little as 60 meters, of fringing wetland in front of a levee, and have that levee only have to be half as tall to do just as much work because it has the fringing wetland. So with this wetland in front, bringing down the wave height, the levee doesn't have to be as large, and that's half as expensive. So whenever you come up with something that has more benefits for half the price, people converge on liking that idea. So people have converged on liking this idea. We also have to plan to raise the height of that wetland over time as sea level rises. And the way we're talking about doing that is by putting silt in front of the toe of it, letting the high tide bring the silt up onto the low marsh to nourish the, raise the elevation of that surface, and using treated sewage effluent on the top with nutrients in it to increase the rate of growth of plants and the rate of accumulation of biomass to raise the upper marsh. So those are the two strategies for thinking about keeping that marsh growing to keep up with sea level rise over time. So I've introduced the Bay Area to you a little bit. I've shown you what's actually happening, that we're spending money on wetlands, that we have this strategy for wetlands that we'll be uh, adding to a lot and testing and trying to improve. But now I want to show you something from the Netherlands that I think is even, uh, well, an additional piece that we need to incorporate in the Bay Area, and we haven't yet. It really combines this idea of uh, shared resourcefulness and expanded compassion. The Dutch have been building ponds that express the water table. These really show the water table. They are just scooped out, um, and then people have been building houses, oops, I'm sorry, in those ponds where um, the pond accepts stormwater from the area around it, and the pond housing sites are sold to higher income people to build what is in the Dutch housing context luxury units. Um, look at this woman and how she's dressed. You can kind of get the sense that they're marketing to a, a higher end crowd. But the pond can hold a good meter of stormwater in it. And that benefits the lower income areas around it. So it's kind of a, I think of it as a great Robin Hood strategy. How do we sell to the rich, have them live in an infrastructure of stormwater ponds? and benefit the people around them who otherwise would have been in a flood zone and not able to improve their homes. So this, to me, is a really great strategy to bring home to California. It's also, in this case, the houses are on pile, friction pile foundations, but we could do this with floating structures. And that, floating structures on pontoons, we've also uh, learned about from the Dutch, is uh, something that can provide us with incredible isolation, base isolation, from uh, seismic damage. So uh, I'll say a little bit more about that as I show you an example from California that we've been uh, doing research about. But this one combines a kind of courage to invest, preparing the ground for private housing, probably by the public, uh, shared resourcefulness, we're all learning together as we try this experiment, we're living uh, in the same place, and then expanded compassion because we're doing these things partly out of concern for others, for our neighbors, uh, as we build these places. And it's such a simple idea. Dig hole, make mound. Really excellent. We don't have to buy steel from China to make all this happen. So we can use our local materials. It's possible that we could have this overall picture of using this material from the pond 
strategy to build that thicker wetland edge and continue to raise it over time. So we're excited about pairing the hole and the mound. This is a study that I did in, uh, with a series of graduate students where we looked at uh, what's currently a golf course, publicly owned golf course, and said, well, how could we move water through that in a controlled way so that the ponds function to improve water quality as they come off of the urban surfaces into this series of ponds and then are discharging water into the bay eventually. So the sequence is partly a treatment train where we improve water quality, something I understand you're considering doing in the red zone. Uh, it seems like a great idea. And then how would we put housing into that environment uh, that's floating on the water table? And then the students made an image of what that might look like to see some of that housing. We did a more detailed case study for a real neighborhood, um, not a golf course, in a neighborhood called East Palo Alto, where uh, all this blue overlay shows you the areas that are under a flood restriction. People can't add a bathroom, improve their house, add a bedroom, until they raise the floor elevation quite a bit, um, between one and two or three even, in some cases, meters higher. So there's a lot of restriction on what's basically a Latino community, relatively low income, um, and yet the value of the houses is really going up. We looked at this little strip right here, which is already a stormwater pond and a section that they want to use for a new downtown center. There's an existing wetland here, and we would have to raise the surface of that over time. Uh, this is a map from Zillow, the house price estimating uh, website that we use to think about how much people's houses are worth. And it shows that these little tiny houses here are now worth between $670,000 and 800 and some odd thousand dollars. This is from last year. By this year, you could add 10% to all of those numbers, possibly 20%. So we're in a housing crisis. We have a huge pinch because we've created a lot of jobs and not a lot of housing. So tiny little houses that look like this are worth three quarters of a million dollars mostly because we haven't densified and we haven't found a way to do that in a zone with high water tables and with uh, surface flooding problems. So this map shows that same area. It, it shows uh, East Palo Alto. There's the Facebook headquarters. There's the Google Plex. Apple is down here. So these major game-changing industries with lots and lots of jobs are right there uh, in the shallow water table zone near the Bay Edge. Um, this brown is a liquefaction zone. So Facebook is right next to one. The roads are on liquefaction zones. The Googleplex is actually on a liquefaction zone. And uh, sections of East Palo Alto are affected by that. And those zones are going to expand as the water table comes up. So uh, like the red zone that you have, the boundaries of all the places we've thought of as dangerous for construction are going to expand, and we need to have strategies for how to build um, as they expand. So the students eventually proposed uh, building in that stormwater pond a floating house community, um, and then adding to the wetland using some of the ideas I just talked about, um, raising the elevation of the surface of the wetland over time to make it function to reduce wave heights. The idea was to bring stormwater from this community into these ponds so that they would no longer be restricted from taking advantage of the equity they have in their homes and adding a bathroom or a bedroom or doing whatever other people would do uh, in an outside a flood zone. So the idea is to let them adapt um, and use these as a protective edge of higher income units. The idea is to connect some units on friction pile foundations to the levees and have others floating on pontoons. We've already seen the technology in service in the Netherlands and other places where they stack units on top of a decking that's supported by pontoons. So it's not one house at a time, it's actually an urban block that people are beginning to float. And it looks like this in the Netherlands, actually built. Um, it's exciting to see that they're beginning to use prefabricated units. We are using a lot more prefabricated units in the Bay Area for rapid construction and for the flexibility that they provide because you can crane a unit into place and then if you get sea level wrong, the sea level rise rate turns out to be much higher, 
in a particular location or the groundwater table becomes more problematic for some reason, you crane that unit out again and put it someplace else with no loss of value. That's an incredible kind of flexibility to have as we think about putting in a lot more housing. You may not have the same housing crisis that we have, but still, the people who are living on the edge of a zone where groundwater is gonna be rising will have to think about a way to live in that zone um, that they don't currently have. So maybe it'll involve some of these ideas about prefabricated units and uh, living on groundwater foundations rather than trying to shore up that loose material that's prone to lateral spread, take it out and live on the water instead. So uh, this is that neighborhood now, East Palo Alto, with an idea that's expanded to a much larger area and the basic functions are mapped on here where we're bringing water down from a, a long gentle slope, filtering it in a green belt park system. Uh, when it's clean, it goes into these ponds that the urban blocks are on with three to five story prefabricated units, and then we release it to the bay after that over the surface of the wetland. Over time, we're hoping that we can expand the ponds. This is a highway right here shown on each map. As sea level continues to rise, we'll add ponds on the other upland side of the highway and eventually abandon these ponds as they get too deep and too difficult to manage, turn them into wetlands, and move the ponds farther up that gentle slope that we have on the edge of the bay. The other uh, piece of this design that might be interesting to you is this white blob, which we're designing as a, um, a sand gate. The idea is to provide ourselves with um, a barrier, I'm sorry, it's the brown blob, not the white blob, a barrier that deals with the problem of what to do where a tributary meets the bay. In the past, we've built tide gates at those locations. The Thames River in London has tide gates all along it where tributaries come in. Those tide gates, as sea level rises, will become walls. They won't open very often. They'll open less and less. Um, and then we'll have to do what they do in New Orleans, which is pump the river water over the tide gate or barrier into the bay. There are pumps the size of university campuses in New Orleans that pump a lot of water over an artificial edge. It, I think it's a mistake to invest in that kind of pumping. So what we're looking at is a, a, something that's kind of native to the California landscape in which you're kind of working with here, developing, which is uh, the way that lagoons are often closed off by sand being transported along the ocean coast. In California, when those lagoons are closed by a lot of sand moving along the coast, in the wintertime, we bulldoze them open to allow flood water to come out. Well, the idea with the sand gate is to place sand at the gap between um, the dikes that we would be putting in behind these wetlands and let slow water during the drier season percolate through that sand because it is permeable. It'll keep the waves out because the waves can't move through the sand and we don't get hurricanes, so our waves are more like a meter maximum in height. Um, and then if we need to, we can open that tide gate in a major storm event, tide gate, the sand gate, with a bulldozer. So we're trying to keep our flexibility and think about things that have habitat value at the same time they're uh, functioning for humans. So that's what I wanted to share with you, basically, was this a set of ideas that were, that some of which are real, some of which are new and speculative and we're trying to attract people to. The real part is the incredible investment in wetlands all around the San Francisco Bay. Um, the floating urban blocks are real in the Netherlands, not yet in the San Francisco Bay area, but that's where we hope to go next, is to developing a response for our housing crisis that's safe, that provides an amenity, that has biodiversity value, um, and that uh, provides benefits to the adjacent communities as well. So those are the ideas I wanted to share with you, and I'm happy to take questions or hear your thoughts about it. Thank you. Do you want to take that one? Christina, um, thank you. 
so much for that. I don't know about you, but I didn't expect to necessarily hear um, what I thought might be a, a heavily technical lecture actually reflect these incredible values of courage and resourcefulness and compassion. And I don't know about you, but I found that so inspiring and hopeful in an age in which those are in short supply. So thank you very much. Um, so we have very bright lights staring at us here on stage. Um, but we have about half an hour um, for questions and discussion. So I would encourage you, you know, we've got half an hour with Christina um, to further mine her expertise and knowledge about this subject of adaptation to sea level rise. So do we have questions for Christina about these topics? Yes, in the middle. So we've got Erica and Emma with um, microphones. And if you could please state your name, that would be really lovely for everyone to, to know who you are. Thank you, Christina. <clears throat> My name's Blair. <clears throat> I understand exactly what you're trying to do in, in bringing this kind of conversation here because it really is going to be very irksome if we have to confront what really is a floodplain made of gravel. We don't really have much rock here. But setting aside the technical problems relating to what that landscape might look like, we've still got an economy that's based on a right to occupy, based on a cadastral survey peg. How do we convince bank managers to, to come into this game? Well, we are, are looking at a, um, a governance instrument that we, our legislature created in the 70s to deal with steep slopes that fail in seismic events. It's called a Geologic Hazard Abatement District. Everyone calls it a GAD. And uh, we're going to try to use that instrument to help property owners get together and make a kind of local government that can tax themselves, uh, buy property, um, exist in perpetuity. So that's an instrument that I think will allow us to transform what are a set of individual private parcels into uh, a group of ponds or raised, we're often raising developments now also, um, to try to bring people together and have them share uh, some investment in that place and have some control over that place. Uh, the, the banks in our context want to invest in housing, but they want to know that that housing is, is safe, that it's been built in a way that's prepared for the future. It's, and not, I, gonna, it's not going to float away. It's not going to float away. It's not going to fall in an earthquake. Um, and it's not going to uh, get black mold, which is a terror everyone in California has. Black mold. All you have to do is say that and people <gasps> freak out. So uh, there are a number of things we have to deal with and I think that the banks are with us in making development that is more resilient. That's what they want. They want a good investment. Cool. Thank you, Blair. Thanks very much for that. My name's Matt. What um, height of sea level rise are you typically looking at in those situations that you're working towards in San Francisco? What would we look at in the San Francisco Bay Area? Uh, we have, for the last almost 10 years now, been talking about two metres by 2100. And the idea of three metres by 2100 is a conceptual challenge for everybody. Uh, and I think it will be applied more to public infrastructure than to private property. Um, but that's what we're talking about. And we had a speaker come through the Bay Area, a woman who worked for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, a rock star in government who was working on coastal resilience, looking at uh, melting in Antarctica. And she told the heads of our public agencies and our insurance industry that it could be three meters by 2060. I got a phone call immediately afterwards from the head of the agency that manages the shoreline, and he said, well, that's it. We can't do wetlands. We have to do walls. And it took me 45 minutes to talk him down and say, look, that's an extreme scenario. It's possible if it's going to happen, and we'll definitely have to make adjustments, but it's not the most likely scenario. 
So we are, we're all coping with this uncertainty and the way that the estimates are constantly going up. Um, that's what I like about the wetland and pond combination. The wetland doesn't have to do all the work. We're talking about an urban district that can absorb some of the water. Hi, my name's Jeff, thank you. Um, two questions, one's just technical, how deep are your deep piles, your friction piles? But the second one is, relates to risk and who has it. My perception in New Zealand is that local and central government always see themselves as being the people who will be sued should things go wrong, and as a result, they seem very reluctant to adopt new technologies. Do you find the same problem in the land of the low government, highly free people to do what they like? Uh, we have an extraordinary litigious society and uh, suing is everyone's first thought at this point. So the way that we would prepare these sites, I, it might be that some of it would be public land that's leased, the sites are leased to people to place uh, prefabricated housing on them. In other cases, it would be private land and people would have a shared liability. But we've gotten used to the idea of uh, earthquake and, and land movement, soil movement, uh, as a risk. People have actually come to accept that. And while there is always a desire to sue the contractor uh, who builds everything, we don't tend to sue the city. We don't tend to sue the public entity that's involved in the planning. So I, I don't think that's the culture that'll occur. I think it's more the designer, the contractor, um, the manager who will try to sue each other. That's our typical circular firing squad that we get into. Um, and, and I'm sure that as these things start to be built, the onus, the, the responsibility will be very clearly legally spelled out because we are a litigious society and the public sector knows they have to protect from lawsuits. So risk will be very clearly uh, given to the private sector. And Jeff's first question on pile Oh, on how deep. We uh, do friction piles um, anywhere from 20 to 30 meters down, so it's expensive. And another advantage of looking at uh, these pontoon foundations is that we wouldn't have to use all that steel. We typically use either steel or concrete um, foundation piles, we wouldn't have to use those materials, which are not great in terms of CO2 emissions. We could use other materials. Um, and I think what's exciting about that is that as we retreat, I don't want to say the word retreat because I can't say it at home, why should I say it here? Uh, as we move those ponds to an advantageous location, <laughs> uh, we won't have to pull out a lot of steel. So putting the pilings in, when you abandon an, an urban developed area, there's a lot of stuff in the ground. It's expensive to pull that stuff out. It is not easy to abandon a developed urban area. There are pipes in the ground, pile foundations in the ground. Uh, as you know, having had to pull buildings out of your damage zones, it's not totally straightforward. There are contaminated soils left behind. Um, so the depth of the pile is a real problem, I think, and it would be better to use a different technology for our foundations. Cool, thanks, Jeff. There. Yes, there's one right here. Emma? Hi, oh, someone's Howie. got it. Sorry, I can't see you behind the... Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah. um, just a two-pronged question. Um, in Christchurch, certainly for some of the estuary-lined areas, the council's particularly risk-adverse as far as building goes, and that appears to have caused quite a bit of constipation of thought in that it's either yes or no, and there is nothing in between. Have you come across that in areas that you've worked with uh, where you've been able to work through that to allow councils to understand the value of those areas. And two, I understand that you walked along the estuary today, 
um, and that you might have uh, some thoughts about our estuary area. It seems to me um, that your estuary would be a great place to try some of these wetland terrace ideas to protect the houses that are still there and to try experiments. That's what I've tried to encourage, well, I've tried to encourage communities all around the world but I, that I talk to, to do pilot projects, to do things that are reversible, no regrets, pilot projects, to see how we can manage wave energy and uh, exposure to sea level rise, rather than decide a priori that either we're going to you know, build a wall that's X meters high and is our investment for the future, or that we have to move away. I'd rather see people observing their environment and trying pilot projects. That's how the Dutch have become the world's consultants on flooding. They try things and they learn from the experiments that they try, which are reversible if they get it wrong. And they don't kick the person out of town who designed the thing that failed. They let that person learn in a team of other people and the whole society gets smarter. So that's what I'd like to see us all do is become more resourceful by trying experiments and living next to those experiments. Thank you. Um, we've got a growing number of questions. We'll um, go to George first and then we'll come up to you, sir, um, with I think the glasses back there. Erica has somebody over here. I don't know if you can see. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, uh, Kira Christina Chorty is my name and um, I really en enjoyed your talk and all the, especially the Robin Hood thing of stormwater and all the different innovations. And um, I don't want to be a spoil sport, but <laughs> what's wrong with allowing? Um, allowing nature to do what it wants to do and what it needs to do, and if it doesn't suit us, to move away somewhere else rather than try to contain it. I mean, We've been reminded mm -hmm. about the forces of nature and um, I sit in a place, um, I, my tūpuna came here for hundreds of years and I'm sure they didn't try and stop the sea as it moved from the edge of Hagley Park and the coastline drew, uh, grew and um, I think, I think, um, we need to honor nature and have a relationship that if it doesn't suit us, then we can find something else. We can live somewhere else. We don't have to be living here. These cities have only been here, as you said, for a few thousand years, a few hundred years, really. Right. And, um, and that was suitable for that time, but now those times have changed, mm -hmm. and I think we can move. Right. So I'm, I'm on the side of nature and, um, and us being resourceful about it. How we do that. I agree that's absolutely part of our resourcefulness that we can move and small communities along the California coast who don't have an economy that will support investments and adaptation will move all around the coasts of the world because they have places to move to. The Bay Area or New York City, the Bay Area is the population of the land I showed you in that image is twice the population of New Zealand. I don't know where they're going to move to. And the population of New York City is, what, up to 10 million now. So I don't know where they're going to move to. Um, I think that there is value in staying with the trouble in some of these places and figuring out how to live with this change. And some of the experiments, we tr experiments that we try will not work, and people will decide they're not happy with it, and they'll move or there are risks and they don't want to tolerate those risks. I'm for nature too, but we've altered the global system and now we live in this weird hybrid of human and nature. The amount of rain that falls, the tide that comes in is a blending of human and natural forces. Uh, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's just where we're at. So. I'm, I'm coping with living in that hybrid world and I can see a wide range of choices that I would define as equally resourceful. Cool, thanks Chalky. And um, we have someone down here. Hi, I'm Vicky. I'm really excited by um, you talking about like the houses and floating because there are some areas, not only the estuary, that we could look at that. This place is, I don't know, does it work with the sea? Like looking at Littleton and the broken communities over there. 
um, and the rising sea level and what they've experienced in their broken community. And I'm also looking around, are we addressing like some of the lower socioeconomic um, people that aren't um, in this room and being um, represented here tonight in some of these? How have we dealt, dealt overseas with that? And also, there is a lot of land, I can see with what you're saying, how it can be redeveloped with recreational facilities. And that, I mean, I've lived in upstate New York. Um, I've seen the floods and the disasters over there with the snowstorms, um, the tornadoes, um, the snow, and all of that. I've experienced um, some of the disasters and that. I've come out of the red zone. I've seen the liquefaction, but I can see recreation, I can see tourism, I can see by some of the natural springs in that, that the red zone can be redeveloped, it does have a chance, the estuary can be revitalised, there is room for nature and return it, but mm -hmm. we have lots of cultures in this area as well that need to be given a chance it wasn't just set on the Maori and the English setting up the city, the Dutch came here too. We need to look outside of that and encompass everybody, not just the disabled, there's different sexual orientations, there's cultures, there's a whole lot. Mm. Community cohesiveness needs to take place too. So, thank you, Vicky. That's um, all right. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, that's several different issues. Um, and I appreciate the comment. I think you're you know, absolutely right. We have to figure out how to bring everyone together. Cultural cohesion is an incredible resource. Being able to share some values is an incredible resource. And where I'm coming from, at the national scale, we have totally divergent senses of what the reality is. So I'm very aware of how painful uh, those social divisions can be. I feel like my country represents that now for the entire world. Um, and when we're talking about uh, doing these kinds of development strategies as an adaptation, we're talking about bringing natural processes with us, seeing ourselves as part of a human natural hybrid world. Um, I think that the socioeconomic issues are fascinating and it's so exciting for me to think about experimenting on the rich. I'm all into that. <laughs> because if you do something, you put wealthy, entitled people into this new infrastructure, if they see something breaking or leaking or not looking right, they immediately call someone who has the power to come and inspect it. Uh, but if you put people with less income and less entitlement and less education, they don't feel entitled to address what seems to be going wrong. So I think that by using the divisions in our society putting them in the right relationships to each other, we can achieve shared benefits. And some of us that have been removed from the red zone, like I believe there's a lot of them that, have, I'm not sure whether it's happened, they want a proposal for rowing on the Avon, and if any of the land ever got remediated, some of them are, bus, are building developers and want to possibly, if the land comes up for sale, purchase land to build along that red zone. And some of us that were forced off our land may never be able to afford to go back there. Uh -huh. I, I think that having the, the zone, the red zone, which I hope at some point you'll come up with a new name for, um, that having that open space is an incredible advantage now because it gives you flexibility to manage water in different ways, to try experiments, just as you might on the edge of your estuary. And uh, I think that's a huge advantage for you. I think you've got incredible resources coming out of the river, the larger river to the north, uh, bringing gravels and sands down to your coast and accreting beachfront. Those are things other communities don't have. You have the materials that you'll be able to use to use your landscape as that safety backbone and other communities have eroding beaches, rivers that only bring silt, uh, much more serious constraints. So I, I look at Christchurch and I see incredible potential to use your own relationship to the land as your way of coming up with adaptive strategies. Cool, thank you, Vicky. Um, there was a question up here, Emma. Uh, 
Um, hi, I'm Richard. A very interesting talk. Um, one thought that came to me, and this is not a visionary type question, is you talk about you put the house on the pond and if it goes high you can always shift the house. But it crossed my mind is that putting a house in is more than just putting a house in. There's all the stuff that you've got to have go into it, like the electricity and the water and the stuff that goes out of it, like the sewer. Mm -hmm. So how complicated is it to add that, to make sure that infrastructure works? Because, you know, on land you just dig a trench, put it in, and you don't have to worry about it moving. But if it's on a water thing, it seems that it's a bit more flexibility. So is that actually complicated, or is it fairly straightforward? The Dutch have done experiments on flexible infrastructure to floating urban blocks, and so have people in California. We have been looking at flexible lifeline infrastructure, water, uh, sewer, electric, because of the seismic activity that surrounds us. So we've already got solutions that seem to work that combine a mix of rigid and flexible conduit. And to be able to bring it to that scale, I think, is the easiest. The harder one is adding flexibility to main lines that cross faults. That's a tough problem. But adding enough flexibility to the system to be able to run things to pontoon floating urban blocks, does, it's not going to go up and down that much. So I think we'll be OK. Thank you, Richard. Um, there's a question up here, um, and then there's one at the back, Erica. Hi there, my name's Peter. Um, sort of in this, if we're exploring this bandwidth of um, experimenting on the rich, if we will. Um, yeah, I'm, I may not have phrased that as delicately <laughs> no, as I should have, but I like to be blunt. <laughs> no, 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 I appreciate it. Um, so just, and. That's, that's often very true, though, that uh, given that green spaces actually improve property values by about 5%, you often find more affluent people sort of on the, uh, on the boundaries of these green spaces and these natural spaces. So as also traditionally some of those folks um, tend to not be so hands-on, have you found any really good ways of getting those people to, um, to really actively be stewards of those places, um, not just to sit back and enjoy them? Well, I know that the people who would occupy uh, units like these in the Bay Area are people who are working 50, 60 hours a week. Um, so they're not going to be doing gardening on the roof. Not a whole lot, anyway. So I think that there are realistic and unrealistic expectations of how much stewardship people will be doing. Uh, if it's empty nest couples, I think you can expect a lot more recreational gardening and uh, care for the environment. Um, so it's not unrealistic, it just has to be matched to the right population of people occupying the housing units. Um, I, I think that engagement with the environment, though, is something that appeals to everyone. We have people paddle boarding on artificial ponds right now next to Google headquarters. So I expect to see that if we manage to do these ponds and housing in them people would take advantage of the recreational amenity of that open water surface and observe the edge and the water levels changing. So I, I think that's an important part of stewardship too, just the awareness of the environment, which we lose by living in concrete boxes and driving our cars to work and back. So I think that these ponds might be a place of people being aware of dynamics, even if they don't have time to cultivate that landscape. Thanks, Peter. And Erica, there's just one further back. No, no, one further back that I spotted. Thank you very much. Um, you can ask, like, Tim's that name is Tim. I um, would like to make a comment to the, just ask you the questions about this community idea. Um, but when you, when you, I've seen all this stuff about the pipes floating houses, you know, we have sister city to Seattle and many of us who are connected at that level um, <clears throat> know the floating community in Lake Union, Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Tom Hanks, Sleepless in Seattle, you know, we've seen those things. And I, when I'm there, the pipes, when the lake fills up with water, we see our lakes here go up and down. Even at the moment, we talk about our level of lake water and the the houses go up and down, the pipes just flexibly work to that. And, but it's always the first question that people ask, you know, is oh, how does it work, you know? And how do you own? Uh, some of those houses in Seattle, you know, $4.5 million 
I mean, the, the new houses, they, they clearly have established their land ownership arrangement. So in South Salito, uh, South Salito, they own, they own, you own the land underneath on the, on the uh, Bay Harbour bed. That's the legality of it, and that seems to work just fine there. And if you go to Vancouver, you see another whole thing there going on. And so, um, it's it's uh, ideas we started talking about with government here in September 2011, just soon after earthquake. It's been very difficult to see anyone pick up too much on ideas because it needs a lot of rethink because we have a certain set of ideas about how we use our environment. Anyhow, I want to get to the question that's really on the basis of what I'm saying because having seen all these communities and visited and talked about the mechanics of the concrete box you put the house on and how do you own it and how does the sewerage work and they all seem to work, they're all, all dealt with and they have been dealt with for a long time. Um, the Seattle one started when depression times and there was a need and it seems to me that we have a need now and it's very well play, put by a lot of comments here today but it seems to me the most important thing is the, is the community because when you talk to the people in any of these places they just love living in those floating communities the, the, the love of the community is amazing and um, somehow I think it's the point we need to restart with um, an architect said, oh, but we, we create communities uh, in our residential subdivisions. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a different sort of community, but they're amazing communities. And I think what we need to be doing here is actually getting some really good examples. Um, the Lake Union one in Seattle is like the size of Merivale here. It's kind of located similarly in the central part of the city. Um, and when you go there, the people will just say, oh, it's just such a great place to live. Can you give us some ideas about just getting this across to people and how we get some really juicy thinking going about how we can do something really, really different? Because that's what many of us have been looking at for a few years and hasn't happened. Well, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people here who travel, who see uh, houseboat communities. Um, the, the difference in what I'm talking about from houseboat community is this idea of providing a steel decking on pontoons at the block scale. Uh, when you live in a houseboat, you feel the motion of the water sometimes in a situation where there's more wind waves. In these, these urban block technologies, you don't feel the motion of the water. So it's more appealing to a wider range of people than living on a barge uh, is even though that has a beautiful intimacy of its own, to be right there on the water and feel a kind of rocking motion occasionally. Um, I think that the, the issue is that we need to try again some experiments and show people what these things can be like without necessarily making a permanent commitment to them. There are uh, international garden shows in Europe where park landscapes get experiments that are housing experiments, that are landscape experiments, planted experiments, that are temporary. And it would be entirely possible to do an experiment that's temporary over a period of months rather than years and then relocate those prefabricated units someplace else. I think we don't embrace that enough, that we have public land that we can do uh, demonstrations on that let people kick the tires, as we say in the United States, and physically see what it would be like to live in this way? Um, I think someone's watching the time for me. Erica, do we have time for one more question? One more. I see Di Lucas had her hand up, so we'll finish with a question from a landscape architect to a landscape architect. Great. No, it's more, it's, it's off topic. <laughs> um, but it's a the, question, isn't it, Di? Yes, yes. <laughs> I would just um, want to ask about the, looking at the coast here, you, you mentioned the accretion from the sediment coming down the Waimakariri, because I wonder how much the concepts are dependent on that, because I understand the latest science is that won't be occurring because of the irrigation takes in the Waimakariri, the... Um, we won't have that accretion of, of the sediments to enable uh -huh. that. So I just want to see how much you would Well, that on sounds that. like something that you can control by policy. We have lots of conflicts between farmers and urban users of water, 
and we hash those conflicts out as we realize what needs there are. Um, you also may see more extreme precipitation events as part of climate change, and those will bring more material down the river at the wet time when the event happens, and a series of events bring it down like a big conveyor belt. Uh, in fact, it may be that the events move more material than the constant steady flow of water anyway. So I don't think that they're completely incompatible, but there may be a seasonality and a timing issue that you allow the high flows to come through. What we've done in California is dammed a lot of our rivers to try to control flooding and provide irrigation upstream, and those dams cut off the flow of sediment, and now our beaches are all moving to Mexico. Um, and leaving us with nothing but a rocky coast. So we've made our situation worse by cutting off the flow of sediment, and I hope you won't do that. There we go. Um, thank you, Christina, um, for a really stimulating talk. Christina was very specific when we were promoting this talk. She said to me that we weren't allowed to say what a superb speaker she was. <laughs> in case we might jinx her. But now we're done, and I can say thank you for a superb talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I would like to thank Regenerate Christchurch for making these conversations possible for us all. And I would, again, encourage you to join our mailing lists and keep in touch with us on social media so that you can hear about the next event in Christchurch Conversations. Thank you for coming. Keep warm and dry as we head into a big weather event tomorrow. So exciting to see the flooding. <laughs> <laughs>